as I go through. I saw a photograph earlier, so it's got to be here. I'm sorry. Here I'm looking at a photograph in Kuwait in 1992, in January 1992, and there is a mine next to me on the beach here. These were the Stinger missile silos. I was wearing a, an abaya, although it was too short, they didn't have anyone long enough for me. And in the background here you can see a double 50 caliber um, weapon. Me and a friend at the White House, that is the podium where you see the president speak from all the time. Me aboard the USS Eisenhower uh, in the Persian Gulf near Iran over in uh, 1992. I had a horrible feeling that something bad was going to happen because there was fluid dripping from the ceiling of the helicopter and I thought, ah, but we made it back. My name is Gwyneth Todd. I am American. I worked at the White House and the Pentagon for many years, and then I served as a political advisor uh, in Bahrain for three years. That's been my career. I am now in Australia. I went to Syria in 1989 to study Arabic in Damascus. It's working. I went to work immediately for the United States Army, and I arrived at my new job 10 days after Saddam had invaded Kuwait. And I spoke Arabic from my training. And so I was put immediately in charge of material sales, particularly medical equipment, chemical defense equipment, you know, for weapons, and uh, Stinger missiles. During that time, as I, said, I, went, I spent a lot of time in various countries, never in Iran themselves, but I had a, a good understanding that you know, Iran was always off limits, especially with the Republicans when they were in power. Uh, we were not to do anything with them. In 1998, I think it was, President Hatemi gave an interview to Christian Amanpour and in it he said that he was open to discussing um, things in a respectful way with the United States. Immediately President Clinton sent a note down to my office, my desk, and said find ways to improve relations. I want to be able to talk to Iran. Only dialogue and discussion can work this out. Our problem was, in America, we have um, a very strong Israeli lobby, APAC. Basically has the power, or they have bragged in the past, to stop any initiative by anyone that they don't like. It's in our national interest to prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. Do not let anyone tell you that a nuclear-armed Iran is just Israel's problem. It is not. Israel must always have the ability to defend itself by itself against any threat. No president and no congressman and no senator can act against AIPAC and hope to be reelected. So President Clinton, he was in his second term, so he had nothing to lose anyway, said, make sure you know what APAC, the Israeli lobby, is doing, because they're going to try to stop this effort. I would go out almost every week for lunch with the political and policy director for APAC. He would be trying to get information out of me about what President Clinton was planning. I was trying to get information out of him to find out which senator they were going to be talking to who would then send us a letter that I would have to answer screaming that we must not deal with Iran. It was a cat and mouse sort of game. 
every time Obama or the administration puts pressure on Netanyahu and Ehud Bar to negotiate, I mean, to negotiate with the Palestinians and to come up with a two-state solution. Suddenly, all over the press, Iran's nuclear weapon appears. And we're like, we're like a dog with a squirrel. If I say, you know, if I call out my dog out here right now and she's patting me and I go, squirrel, she'll tear off. Doesn't matter how much she loves me. Because, and, and that's how we act. Every time Israel says, Iranian nukes, we go, forget the peace process, forget the Palestinians, oh my God. So it's a very, very useful tool. I got a call from a, a woman and she said, can you meet me at this restaurant? And I said, sure. And I went to the restaurant and she, there she was with another woman. And they pulled out their badges and they said, we're with the FBI. And I said, okay. And they said, look, we have finally been given approval to go ahead and find out who is spreading intelligence, leaking intelligence to Israel um, to try to start a war with Iran. And you know the person very well who we really think is doing this. This particular man was in the middle of his sixth divorce. And I went out with him once a week uh, for dinner. And we would discuss um, everything, his family, but I would try to get him talking about who was passing information and what were they trying to do about Iran. Why are you supporting war against Iraq? You know, Saddam Hussein is awful, but you don't have a good replacement. Uh, many, many, many people are going to be killed. He said to me, we don't care about Iraq. Israel doesn't care about Iraq. We just want a base from which to operate for regime change in Iran. And that is where we identified Larry Franklin who was a Pentagon official who was passing information to the Israeli lobby. They actually caught him going into a restaurant where the Israeli lobby guys were waiting and he was carrying a classified document about Iran and they got him red-handed. He pleaded guilty to spying and passing secret documents. But they still had to try the Americans. And the Americans were the Israeli lobbyists. Nobody wanted to touch them. So in 2004, I was called by the FBI again. We know these people are spying. They've been caught ready to receive information. It all has to do with Iran. Can you come down and talk to the Department of Justice officials? And I said, yes. I was confronted by a bunch of men who were actually quite hostile. They were being quite nasty. And I turned around and I said, I don't think you understand what is at stake here. I said, Iraq is in terrible turmoil. People are being killed everywhere. Uh, it's not going to get better. Now, now we're talking about people who are, want war with Iran. You're talking about possibly starting World War III. You would kill, you know, hundreds of thousands or more Iranians. And there would be Americans killed. And it might be the one thing that would unify Sunni and Shia against all of us. Because Iran doesn't like Al-Qaeda. But if we're bombing Iran, they'll side with, with you know, Saudi and others because uh, 
it's a threat. It's a threat to the to Islam, to the Muslim Ummah. It's a threat to everything. They excused me. They said, you know, thank you very much. We'll call you. Iraq was going to be the stepping stone for regime change in Iran. We were going to invade Iraq, set up a government that was friendly to Israel and friendly to us. And from there, they would be able to meddle in Iranian politics and create problems. That was the original plan. So they had to get everyone into a we had to get into Iraq, we had to get rid of Saddam. I was asked to come out to Bahrain, and my job was force protection and political advice. I had no immunity, I was not a, uh, a diplomat, I was not a military, I mean a government employee, I was a civilian. I made sure that our admirals and our people and our ship captains going out there, I would lecture them and I would explain the truth. Listen, this is a routine game that is played. Don't overreact. And all was fine until 2007. A friend of mine was working there at the uh, Navy base. And I sat down and I spoke to the American Admiral. He said, look, what I'm really worried about is there'll be a miscommunication. Somebody will think that someone's actually going to fire at them. and." then we'll start a war. And he said, so I, I'd like to set up a phone line to the Iranians that we could call and say, look, whatever we're doing is routine. You're going to Washington to propose that? He said, yes. I said, you're going to be shot down. He said, you think? No. Why would they shoot me down? I said, because the people you're talking to want a war with Iran. No, 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 no. Nobody wants a war with Iran. I said, yes, they do. And these are the same people who dragged us into war in Iraq. They'll do it if they can. And so it all happened as I said it would. The line was never set up. In 2007, George Bush saw that as his last chance to start a war with Iran and to enact regime change. He therefore um, pulled the admiral that we had there, who was very, very good, back and sent out a new admiral. This new admiral I had known when he was only a captain at the White House. He had one day accidentally mistaken me for an intern and asked me to take out the garbage. And I had looked at him and I said, do I look like a garbage man to you? Well, I didn't see him again until I was in Bahrain and suddenly there he was, but now he had three stars on his shoulder and it was a vice admiral and my new boss. So maybe I should have taken out the garbage. He said immediately when he came that his agenda was to make sure that Iran was pushed back into a box. In May of 2007, there were the first talks scheduled with Iran and Iraq in Baghdad. And those talks were meant to try to you know, stop the violence in Iraq. And they were very, very important because things were very bad in Iraq and we'd caused it. What the uh, Admiral did was he decided that he would pick that very week to move aircraft carriers around into the Persian Gulf. Nobody has time to look at ship movements all day long. It's left to the military commanders because it's just, nobody has time. Nobody would notice this. The State Department wouldn't notice this unless somebody told them. I want to make sure that nobody in Washington finds out that we're doing this. We're just gonna go through there and see what the reaction is from Iran. It wasn't a buildup for war, but it would look like it and it might make somebody panic and shoot. And all we need is one shot and then we can just, you know, open fire, self-defense. Even the Department of Defense didn't know. And they came down and they told the Admiral, you will not, you can do this, but you will tell 
our Persian Gulf allies exactly that this is peaceful. And as I understand it, we even went so far as to send a message to Iran saying, don't worry about this deployment, it's peaceful. The Admiral called me down into his office and he made me sit there while he called uh, the Saudis. Of course, the Saudis already knew by then, as did the Iranians. The whole plan had been foiled. And I was sitting in my office at about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, 2.30, and a young lieutenant came in with a piece of paper in a folder. And it basically said that um, there was a threat sponsored by Iran against American military personnel. Now, this made no sense to me. They wouldn't be taking orders from Iran if Iran were giving them. The admiral called me down to his office. We discussed it. I said, it doesn't make sense. But if it's true, you know, people could die. Can you help us? You're the only person who knows enough people on this island to find out the truth. You'd have no cover or anything, but you might save lives. And I thought, okay, if it saves lives, yes. Um, I'm an idiot. I mean, he fooled me completely, but uh, he knew how I am, and I did it. I didn't meet with the supposed bombers. I met with a man who was a very honorable human rights activist. I said, look, is there a plot? And he said, no, absolutely not. And he said, and if someone even says there's a plot, they're trying to start a, a fight. Uh, something's wrong here. I said, okay, I'll go back and report that. While we were sitting there, two plainclothes policemen came up to us and they shook his hand and mine and he went white. You know, and they made a joke about how he'd gained weight and he needed to be able to outrun him. When they left, he explained to me that those were men who had tortured him when he'd been in prison in Bahrain. So he said, something's going on here that's very bad. Now, I said, let's all go my way, you go yours. So I came back to the base that night at 10.30 at night, and I used my badges and they didn't work. I thought, oh God, you know, it's not working, the machine. So I called the duty officer and he knew me and he said, come on. You know. So I went in, I typed up the whole report, everything saying, Iran is not planning this. There is nothing going on like this. In fact, whoever reported this is probably up to no good. You need to find out. And I put it on the desk of the head of intelligence and I went home. He came in after midnight. He typed it up and he filed it and he sent it back to Washington without asking the Admiral because the Admiral was unavailable. The next morning at seven o'clock, I came into the office it was a Friday, so it wasn't a work day, but I was greeted at the door by the head of intelligence. He said, get off the base. Something's wrong. He said, I filed your report. It was one of the best reports I've seen. Uh, it's gone back to Washington, but the admiral is furious, and so is the security officer. And I called Commander Chow. I said, what's going on? She said, we have suspended your top secret special access intelligence uh, clearance. I said, why? And she said, it, that's classified. And I said, well, I'd like an explanation. She said, come to the base. And I said, no, you come to me. She said, no. So I was completely confused at this point. I called my friend. Uh, who was at the base, and I said, I need you to go find out what's going on. He went, and he found, went to speak to the chief of staff, and he found a letter, which I have, dated December 13th, 2007. It is prepared by Commander Chow. It suspends my top secret special access clearance. It tells me my badges have been deactivated. And it says that all my colleagues have been notified. They sent 
the, the Bahraini police to that village. And they were waiting for me to drive in there. And I was going to be either arrested or killed. If I were arrested, they would pull out this letter and they would say she was actually a spy for Iran. We had just informed her that we were suspending her clearance and she was going out to plan a terrorist attack with Iranian-backed people. That would justify a war. The other option would be that I would be killed, in which case they would say the Iranians killed an American in Bahrain, and that would be justification for attacking Iran. Those are the only two options I can think of. They tried to hide the letter. They did not let me have it, but my friend had seen it. I fought for three months. I finally got the letter. By that time, I was in Australia. But in the interim, uh, I got a lot of support from all my colleagues. But nobody would, the lawyers, no one would talk to me about anything. They wouldn't give me any answers. I came to Australia just to try to figure out what had happened for a, a short visit. And while I was here, uh, one of my other, I had a company, I was, I was a contractor, it was my own company. My other client was a Turkish billionaire. And he said to me, I will pay all your bills, don't worry. So I got here in January 2008 he transferred money for me to pay my lawyers, which was a lot of money. And he was found shot dead on the sidewalk in Istanbul two days later. And they ruled it a suicide. But there was no note. It was a Saturday afternoon on a sidewalk. Who kills themselves like that in a place like that? I got an email saying, sorry, he's dead. Yeah, these people don't mess around. They wanted war. And they want war now. It'll be you and me who will die, and our families, and babies, if there is a war like this. Financially, they ruined me. We just bought this house, as I said, we moved in three weeks ago. Uh, but, you know, I, I know that they have gone out of their way to stop me from getting work. Um, I know that they have called people and told them not to interview me. I have had the FBI show up on my doorstep undercover and try to lure me to the embassy. Uh, there's a very high cost, but I'm very positive about it. And I'm just one person. I can't change everything. I, I feel, I, it's almost, I, I find it um, almost too arrogant to be upset about the fact that I was unable to stop the Iraq war and invasion because you know, who am I to stop a war? I'm not, shouldn't be that powerful. But I knew how few people were, were running it and just no one would listen. So I felt that I did have that ability and I failed. But, uh, you know, you win some, you lose some. Free press is really hard for the people who carry out these conspiracies. Because when they see that actually, you know, in the media, that we're all normal people, 
I respect you know, the Jewish faith, and I respect the Buddhist faith and the Hindu faith. People are people. It's what they do. It's not how you label them. And there, there are no organizations that can fix this. Only people can fix it. And if you come out with too much in the media that is um, against the agenda of these people, you find your satellite connection cut off.